both, I think, as an individual and as a company, you want to work on something that nobody has a name for. Okay, when there's no name for what you're doing, that means that there's no category, and you have a difficulty explaining to people even what it is that you're doing. That means that you are on the path to the only. Kevin, thanks for being on the podcast today. You know, the great Chris Michael has been talking about introducing us for years. And finally, a few weeks ago, you and I had a chance to take a hike down near Pacifica, down near your home. And it was uh, delightful. And I really enjoyed it. And so glad we're getting a chance to keep going. Yeah, it was a wonderful day and a beautiful backdrop to a fantastic conversation. So thank you. So when I describe you to people, I first start off by saying that you're just relentlessly curious and you're a person who lives and breathes ideas. And my wife always says that I don't need food and I just eat ideas. And I think that you're just like that and even more so. I've also noticed, Kevin, that having been the founder of Wired and one of the people at the Whole Earth Catalog and been involved in so many of these sort of cultural entrepreneurial projects that we've seen over the last few decades, that you're just a nonstop content producer. I mean, you have so many projects, whether it's a video channel or whether it's a graphic novel or whether it's books or podcasts like you're doing with us today, so many different mediums for content. And the first thing that I feel is like you're almost creating a network effect around yourself for ideas where you're putting ideas out, you're putting questions out into the ether in all these different ways. And then the ideas are coming back to you. And I see this swirl. Do you feel that way? Is that something you've purposely architected in your life? It's a wonderful way to put it. I like that image of the network effects, which for people who don't know, the way it operates is that the more you give it, the more it produces and the more it attracts giving. And so it feeds and kind of avalanches outward in that way. And I think, yes, you're exactly right. That that's what's happening. You're exactly wrong that I was anything deliberate about it. I think I fell into it more than anything else. But it does work that way in which the more ideas you have, the more ideas it unlooses and attracts to you. So you have yet even more ideas. And I think that is sort of the secret sauce of this world of network communications is that they exhibit these network effects in all dimensions. And if you can tap into one, it's wonderful because you can go for quite a ride. And I think all kinds of aspects of our lives are this. And I would say it's true not only for ideas, but I would say there's a universal truth buried even deeper that is true for giving. That if you are a giver, the more you give, the more you get, the more you get, the more you give. And that also is a network effects. Yeah, that is a cultural effect that very few cultures I've been a part of have, but it's certainly one that I feel in the Bay Area having moved here from Boston. Do you feel that that is universally true or do you think that some geographies, cultures, people exhibit a more pay it forward giving type of motion than others? I would say both. I would say it is a universal principle and there are certain areas that amplify it more than others. And I think you are also correct that Silicon Valley has institutionalized some aspects of this where it has emphasized sharing to maybe a greater degree than other cultures have. Are there any sort of principles, any missions that are driving you at this point that aren't particularly just something you fell into, something that was crystallized? The people listening to this are early stage and young entrepreneurs, right? We got 250,000 people who tend to listen to this and they tend to be in that category. And what we're trying to help them see are things that others don't see. And I get the strong sense, having read a lot of your stuff, that you see a lot of things most people don't see. Right. And are there principles that you've crystallized? Well, we mentioned sharing. I would say there's a couple other kind of classic virtues, like gratitude, I think is a fundamental, which is very aligned with humility, but gratitude is very related to luck. Basically, it's appreciating how lucky we are. And I think luck is a huge component and not talked often enough because there is an element of luck. And if you are really honest about your successes, there's a huge degree of it that is attributed to luck. And I think I respect those people who acknowledge the luck in their life, which is a form of gratitude. That's more on the personal level. One of my missions is to be a good ancestor, to try to incorporate more uh, a long-term view. Now, this is countered 
in some ways to the mission of a young startup, which is often battling for survival uh, long enough to be able to take the long view. And so there is a very immediate now oriented framework for startups, and that's understandable. But I think if you want to zig where others are zagging, and this is sort of Jeff Bezos' idea, is if you think about things that don't change very fast, if you operate on a longer term perspective, you have an advantage because everyone else is completely short-sighted. And I think that taking a longer view of things can set you apart. And part of what happens when you take a longer view is you think less about things like competitors and you think more about civilizational scale, infrastructural necessities, feeding the network, all these other kinds of things that in the long run will be more important and may liberate you in having an approach that others don't. And by the way, your ancestors will thank you. Got it. And what is causing the short-term thinking? Is it a sense of survival? Is it an amygdala problem? Is it a... No, I think it's partly just the nature of startups. You have immediate needs. Now, maybe there are institutional things that we can do as a society to help early stage companies not be so short-sighted, but I think it's hard to do on their own just because of the pressures of getting started and survival. And it also, by the way, I have to say, it may be that longer term thinking may not be something that we should expect. And it might be something that we have to invent other kinds of institutions for. Governments can certainly do some amount of it. They're not allowed to fail. Nonprofits, to some degree, are kind of a third category that could do longer stuff, yeah, but they don't have that much power. But maybe we can, this is all we do, we invent different structures. We can invent maybe institutions that have the legal, social, economic power to do things in the world that have a little bit longer term. And let me just give you an example. It's like one of the things that we don't do very well is long-term research. There's very few experiments that last more than four years, which is the average postdoc tenure. So we don't even have a very good facility for doing a long-range research that might take long to do or two may take 20 years to pay out. So you're funding some kind of basic research that you have no expectation of making sense even or being developed at least for 20 years. And maybe during your lifetime. It may be during your lifetime. And you know, to the funders and the government, that may look like a waste. So you might need another kind of an institution that would protect that research for the duration, or maybe as some argue, maybe there's some way we can turn the value that's created by that research and have it come back and pay into that instead of just going to all the entrepreneurs who bank on it. So I think we can be innovative in ways in which we can be good ancestors and not always think long-term. It may be that your audience here, the entrepreneurs starting things, this may not be front of mind for them. And it should be friend of mine if they have any level of success. And so some of you will someday be the reigning dominant mega tycoons. So just remember this. <laughs> yeah. And so you get companies with network effects that are going to be around yeah. a long time because they're hard exactly. to dislodge, whether it's Craigslist right. or Facebook or whatever. And at some point, those people running those companies have to emerge from their chrysalis of short-term thinking into being more of a steward of the future. They have to take that emotional sort of journey, that maturation process. So one of the things that network effects does is it imprisons the winners of those network effects in a prison of success. And they're imprisoned by their success because the way things work is that the truly disruptive, game-changing innovation breakthrough business is going to come from outside of their core success. That's just the general pattern. And the reason why it comes from outside their success is because the more successful a company is, the more likely they are to use money to try to solve a problem. Okay, so they have some problem, there's something that doesn't work, whatever it is, and there's bank loads of money or cash and people, and they're going to apply remedy to the problem. And there's an old Jewish saying that any problem that can be solved with money is not really a problem. And so what happens that they try to buy solutions. Now, the startups would like to do that too, but they don't have any resources. They don't have any money. They don't have people. They don't have anything. And so they have to be really scrappy and they have to invent and figure out and innovate a solution without resources. And that is the solution that works. That's the solution that is going to spread and succeed because they have used genius to 
solve it instead of money. And so it begins to rise. And as much as the big companies then would say, okay, well, then we'll just move over to there and take over. But the problem is that to do so means that they have to come down from the optimization they have been working so hard to produce. So the excellence that they're all working toward, the optimization and the efficiency. The problem is that the new innovation is always in a territory where there's low profits, it's unproven, it's high failure rate. It's a terrible place to do business. The only people who do business there are crazy startups. No sane person is going to be there. And so to move a successful company down into that territory requires devolution, requires going backwards, requires undoing their optimization and their quest of excellence. It means doing less excellent. And there's nobody or nothing in the company that is very successful that is good in going in that direction. They can't really de-optimize and head and move their thinking and everything else into this territory where it's terrible business. And so what happens is the startups are left to keep doing things until they pass some threshold of basic viable customer satisfaction. And there already the works effects are in and it's too late and they're off to the business. So that's the advantage. And so what that means for startups is you need to sort of amplify and augment and enhance the fact that you have lack of resources. That is actually your chief asset. To put people in the cooker to come up with something new. And then each of the pieces of the company are interlinked to each other and need to support each other. And that whole ecosystem of that startup, even if it's six people or 12 people, you can't get that same small ecosystem functioning in a large corporation because they have completely different infrastructure and mental models and what they consider to be good. Well, they also have just too much resource and too much money. They're going to solve it by applying a flood of resources and they're going to miss the true innovation, which you can only get to if you don't have those resources. If you have to be scrappy. You've got to be a desperado genius. almost. Desperado, exactly. You have to be desperate. And so that desperation that you want so bad to get out of is actually your chief asset in the beginning. I wouldn't say you should be a hurry, but you should understand that is to your benefit. And someday, if you're successful, you may lament the fact that your company is no longer that scrappy. And often we look back and say, those are the good old days. Right. And in many ways they were. So that's one thing. And the other kind of related idea is this idea of premature optimization, which I think is the downfall of many individual people. We're all into optimizing things, but the thing is you have to be extremely careful about what you're optimizing. You want to scale the wall, but you want to make sure your ladder is leaning against the right wall. Once you get on the process of optimization, for the reason I just said, it's very hard to come back down and de-optimize. And so this process of keep scanning the territory, scanning the landscape, scanning relentless, curious way to see if there are other ways of doing it, even while you're embarked and trying to make things better and perfect, of just reminding yourself and confirming that that is the path. Because in this kind of a landscape where things change fast, there may be a better way happening while you're doing it. And you don't want to get stuck in that. You want to be able to be agile. And it's interesting because there's an inner battle that you have with yourself about, am I doing the right thing? You sort of check in. If you do it too often, you'll tire yourself out. But if you don't do it often enough, you're going to find yourself in the wrong spot. But then this further complication is that you've brought on employees, you've brought on investors, you've brought on people in the press who believe in you and are putting their reputations on the line to talk about you. And now suddenly you realize you're in the wrong spot. What do you do? Right. It's very much like raising kids. You want kids to be exposed to all these things and not to optimize on one thing too early. At the same time, you want to teach them grit and follow through and persistence. And it's a balance about, you know, too much of one versus too much of the other. So there is an artful balance. And that is the kind of a thread that an entrepreneur is trying to thread. You know, we're talking here about sort of character and personality and mental mindsets. And I'm going to go back to this idea of this chrysalis where, you know, we're transforming from a short-term founder to a long-term steward. And I want to focus on this for a minute because we know that network effects bring and build durability, defensibility, long-term utility, uh, value, right? And that's where you get the, so much value. So ultimately, by building those types of business, by investing in those types of companies with network effects, we want to be growing future stewards at scale. I mean, that's kind of the hope, right? That, you know, through looking at these projects, getting people putting their ladders on the right wall, we're now growing future stewards at scale. But are there certain types of people that you've noticed who are optimized to handle that responsibility and that opportunity once they get there? 
Do we have a mismatch? Are the people who are capable of getting to that position, you know, the people who have directly those personality types and mental models that make them ill-suited to be stewards? I don't have that much experience in, you know, talking to armies of uh, entrepreneurs and being able to sort things out. So I don't have an intuition about A, whether there are special people like that and B, what character would be. I think the one thing that I have been impressed by in talking to, I would say, many high achievers not just entrepreneurs, but of all classes from actors, singers, musicians, you know, business people, writers, the whole thing. I would say that the sort of the more curly cue their career path was, the higher they went. Almost none of them have a direct path. And uh, anybody on a kind of direct path, I would be kind of skeptical of that. I think a kind of meander is, I almost would say essential, but certainly conducive to really becoming a world-class individual and only. So I resonate with this idea that is often attributed to Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, but I'm not sure he's the person to say, which is don't be the best. So I am really interested in companies and businesses, individuals who are the only, who've become the only. And that to me is a much better place to be than just merely the best. The only would be a guy who uh, does magic for humans. I don't remember his name, but he's a magician. A magician that has a very special style where he's a street musician going out on the street. And he has wrapped up his magic, you know, prattle into kind of themes about like fatherhood or motherhood or telling the truth or things like that. And so as far as I can tell, he's like the only person doing that. That's a niche for him, a certain kind of magic in a sermon, you know, maybe put that way. Justin Willman. There you go. Yeah. So he's an only in my book. He's not really competing against other magicians. He has this little niche to himself. Both, I think, as an individual and as a company, you want to work on something that nobody has a name for, okay? When there's no name for what you're doing, that means that there's no category. And you have a difficulty explaining to people even what it is that you're doing. That means that you are on the path to the only because there's no category. So if you're trying to become like the best basketball player in the world, that's a zero sum game. There's only a limited number of major league players and it's fixed. But if you're going to become, you know, the best horseback golf pro, right? Somebody who's playing golf from a horseback. I'm just making something silly. You're not competing against anybody. That's one of a kind. So you are kind of making your own niche. You're not having to displace someone or take someone else's job. And, but isn't that a little bit painful to be on the periphery, to be on the edge? You're not mainstream then because people don't really know what you do. And you're at dinner parties right. and people are like, what do you do? You play golf on a horse? Okay, let's talk about something I understand. Right, exactly. It is. It's really hard. And here's the other hard part, difficult part. What you want to be doing for these things is not just you know trying to do golf on a horse unless you have exactly that right combination of talents, right? So you want to be arriving at a place that either you as an individual or you as a company have the absolute required set of skill and talents. So it's like you're trying to find something in your own life where you are arriving that your special mix of talents is particularly suited for. And the same thing with a company is that if you're trying to do something that you can't do, you're never going to be the only. You have to be doing something that you are equipped, particularly especially equipped to do. And so that's a high bar to get to for individuals and companies is to even be aware. And it often will take a long time for you to arrive as an individual to understand what your gifts are. That's where the meandering comes from. That's where this long path comes from. And so when you're trying to do that as a company, that's also a high bar. Not only do you have trouble telling people what you're doing or convincing investors that you will succeed, but you also have to be incredibly self-aware of your own abilities and talents. Yeah. And you have to be lucky, as you said before, maybe a little bit. Right. Always. You know, this is a question you probably get asked a lot, but for our listeners, you come into this utopian technological view of Wired. It's the only, right? I mean, it's an example of an only. Absolutely, because nobody understood what we were doing. There was no market. There was no category to show the magazine on. They said, what is this? We were definitely an only. So what compelled you at the time? So many things. It seems like, you know, something that came out of the blue, but of course there was a, at the time, a very gradual ramp up. What came together for that to be born? The major parents of Wired were Louis Rosetto and Jane Metcalf. And I was trying to put out a magazine, a similar kind of magazine at Whole Worth. It was called Signal. 
In fact, even today, I had a podcast with some guy who had covered the original book of Signal and was just lamenting that he hadn't seen it when it came out in the 80s because everything in the Wired was kind of covering. But the difference was I was talking about ideas and tools and talking about this new emerging world. And Lewis and Jane, their creative genius was saying, no, no, we want to talk about the people who are making the tools and ideas. We're going to wrap all these tools and ideas around people. And we're going to have people on the cover. And it's like, that was absolutely correct and right. And that was the genius thing. And so Lewis and Jane made um, a prototype, which they showed me and looking for an editor. And Lewis said one thing that sold me. He said, I am trying to make a magazine that feels as if it's been mailed back from the future. I said, okay, yeah, sign me up. That will work for me. And so what we were trying to do at that time was kind of very simple. There was a business proposition, editorial, and we really kept them different. The editorial proposition was very blunt. It was like, there is a revolution coming and you've got to wake up to it. it. This digital stuff is going to become the central thing. Now, that seems perfectly obvious to us now, but believe me, the resistance to that was unbelievable. People totally, constantly dismiss it. Oh, it's teenage boys in their basement. This is CB radio. This is never going to be mainstream. I'm never going to buy anything on their name. That's totally ridiculous, preposterous. And so on down the line. It was a hard sell. It was not an obvious thing. There were a group of people in Silicon Valley who immediately got it, but this was not mainstream America. We went out to the niche and that comes to the business proposition because this was, again, the genius of Lewis and Jane. I was running a magazine and Signal was part of it in Whole Earth where it was user-generated content. We were doing the internet on newsprint where the users were writing it and it was going back to them. There was no ads. It was user supported, subscription supported, very fast. And it was very internet-y and bloggy, but the business model was, you know, was subscription, pretty simple. Lewis and Jane wanted to have a real glossy magazine with ads support. And so the business proposition was to the advertisers was very simple. Look, here's a bunch of people who are not just very interesting, but they're well paid and they are reading no magazines. They're not watching TV. They have, they're maybe hanging out online, but nobody's reaching them. We can reach them. And what is that market? Well, we don't have a name for it. There's no other magazines like this. This is the only, but believe us, these are the audience that you want and we can reach them with this magazine. That was the proposition. And that somehow flew because when you're doing something where you're the only, it is very hard to get other people on board. It's hard to get employees. It's hard to get investors. It's hard to get advertisers. And you have to do a lot of really good convincing. Right. And for 10 years, we kept expecting another competitor to come up and never did. Because no one could still see it. No one could still see it. Yeah. And the thing too, and this was the sorry story of Wired, which has a whole saga in itself, is that at this same time, we were inventing the web. Wired invented the click-through ad banner. Wired, we had one of the first online publications. We had our own search engine and we were on our way to do an ad auction before the magazine before the company was split up and sold during the bust and Wired.com was separated from the magazine. It was a total disaster because we had a failed IPO. So the only point about that was not only were we doing the magazine, but we were doing online publication world at the same time. And we had more people working on the digital side than we had working on the magazine, which was all lost once the magazine was sold. So the point there was we were the only in a couple of, that's part of the reason why there was no competitors, because we were way ahead in trying to discover things, make mistakes. Not everything worked. That's part of the thing, but we were only in many, many dimensions. Yeah. And so you guys were actually in position at that time to be the Google Yes. Right. We were on the way to be the Google. We could have been the Google, but we had short-term thinking VCs who were spooked by the dot-com, who wanted to break up and sell the most valuable part of the magazine, which was the wire.com, taking away from the brand. And we kept saying, no, relax. This is a temporary thing. The, the dot bust is good for everybody. Just don't try and sell now. But we lost control because we had fail IPO. is very complicated. Yeah. So the founders lost control of the company and we left shortly afterwards. So I guess I'd like to fast forward a little bit to maybe a decade later when you pop out this wonderful book, What Does Technology Want? You have this beautiful description about how before we saw technology, we didn't even see that it was surrounding us in a way. It was sort of like the two fish swimming in the water. They don't know how the water is today. But then suddenly we saw it for what it was. 
And we couldn't believe that we hadn't seen technology earlier. And this was back in, let's say, 1800, because we didn't think until 1800 about technology as a distinct thing. I mean, that's remarkable. It was even later. It was like 1850 before the first, basically, use of the word technology came about. And it was used to describe a course, I think at MIT, talking about what was formerly called practical arts or something like that. And so this was the, kind of like the first sense that there was a something there that was more than just a kind of a parade of inventions, which was really how we thought of technology and how many people still do. And this was similar to the way we thought about the natural world before Darwin, which was a cabinet full of a series of different really curious organisms with no real understanding how they all fit together. Today, in most people's minds, they have a kind of a parade of different inventions with patents, and there's no sense that they all fit together or what's kind of driving them. And I'm offering a theory of technology, which uses the concept of a system of all the technologies that are self-codependent on each other is I call the technium. And it means that there really are no standalone technology species. All the species depend on the other species for their survival. And the same thing with technology. A computer needs a factory. The factory needs a computer. A saw can make a hammer handle. The hammer is needed for the saw. And you have have this kind of codependency, this ecosystem of hundreds, if not thousands of uh, technologies that are required to support each other. And as we make things more and more complicated, that's more and more true. You and me and the smartest 50 people that we knew, and we could not make uh, an iPhone, right? I mean, it's just- That's right. It just, not from scratch. From scratch. It just requires so many other technologies, which themselves require other ones that it's a system. And this system I call the technium, which is all the technologies in the world together. And that technium, like any system, has- biases, has tendencies, has strange attractors, has a leaning. And I call that wants, which is a strong word, but it just like a bacteria wants food, even though it's not conscious. This is not a conscious one. It's just a desire, a leaning, a tendency. And so that idea of the whole system, I think is important to keep in mind that it will have certain tendencies. Like what would be a tendency? What I'm saying is the tendencies that it wants grow out of the fact that this is an extension of self-organizing principles of the universe and life, and that it is actually the same dynamics that run through evolution in life. We best think of the technium not as something that humans make out of our mind. The birth of it is actually back at the Big Bang, that it's actually cosmological force that's running through the galaxies and the planets and the life, and then it's being accelerated through the technium and will go beyond us. And so that there's this kind of long arc of this force. What technium wants is very similar to what evolution wants, which is it's headed towards increased complexity, increased diversity, increasing specialization, increasing mutualism and other things. So we can kind of talk about what those are, but not destinations, not even destinies, but their directions to where we're going. And if I'm true, if this is true, if this is right, what that means is that all things being equal, the technology in the future will become more complicated, more complex. All the things we make will tend to have more specialized versions of themselves that as we go along, we will keep making more diverse kinds of things. Increased mutualism means that more and more technology will depend on other technologies and not on humans, the meaning that like a lot of the technology we will make will never see a human, will never be touched by a human. It's all going to be in the service of other machines. True of life, there's you know 50% of the organisms on this planet are parasitic. Mm. They are actually wholly codependent on other organisms. They can't live without those other organisms. Those are some of the kind of directions that technology is headed for, and there are others. But if we understand that, we can look for what those other directions are, what it kind of is leaning towards. And I, to answer your original question to start this was, what am I doing? What are my goals? One of my goals is to listen to the technology, to listen to it, to see if we can discern where it tends to want to go outside our own desires of where we hope it goes. The way that we can do that, I think, is by watching how people actually use the technology versus how it was invented for. I think you can see how outlaws and kids use it. I think we can 
give it a couple generations and we can tell more through the use of it and the street use of it. There's ways that we can listen to the technology to try and discern what its biases are. Got it. And eventually, does that mean that, you know, we are like Hans Moravec said in the 70s, going to merge with the intelligence of the universe and that that is sort of the ultimate flowering of complex life on this planet? I don't think there is a destination. I think there's directions. So I'm not this kind of Tehelder Shardan, New Sphere, Omega Point, where we're all going to converge. I think maybe Hans is a little bit more like that. I think we kind of radiate outward, expanding into the universe with more and more possibilities until we fill all possible universes or all possible planets with all possible ways. That's hardly a destination. That's more of a direction. Right. It's an infinity state. In yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah, got it. And so, you know, bringing it back a little bit, one of the inputs to the technium, to this organic growing of technologies and evolutions, which I think we would agree is accelerating. Part of the inputs to it is this whole VC startup ecosystem, right? A lot of our most intelligent people are now being drawn, not into McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, but hopefully into startups. These startups are very tactical, very short term, as we've discussed. They're very applied. It's one feeder into the overall organism of technology, right? The overall tech team. How do you think we're doing? As you look around and look at people's behavior, like you were yourself one of these startup people with Wired and the Wired Digital and all that. What should we be doing differently? That's a really great question. What happens in America, particularly what happens in Silicon Valley, is just a small part of what's happening on this planet. I spend a lot of time in China. My wife is Chinese, kids are bilingual. So I care a lot about what's happening in China. And what I would love to see is a similar kind of thing that happened here in Silicon Valley happened in China and other places in the world, India and Brazil and all these other places. We want to see more of that. In addition to the, your specific question about maybe what can Silicon Valley do better, I would like to see more of this sprouting up around the world. This being Silicon Valley's mindset, Silicon Valley's methods. We were talking earlier about the kind of sheeredness, the shared network effects, the network effects of sharing, yeah. of gratitude, and the kind of accelerated learning. One of the things we didn't get to talk about that I have an utter fascination with is the underappreciated value of YouTube as a means of accelerating learning and culture around the world. More of that. So it's not just Silicon Valley. It's sort of the spread of this sharing, accelerated learning kind of a culture. And, you know, I don't have a list of prescriptions what I think Silicon Valley needs to do or not to do. But I do have a couple of prescriptions and that may go beyond. I think it is crucial and fundamental and essential that we spend more money as a society on basic science and research of the type that may not pay off. And so that is one of the unalloyed, un irrefutable investments that pay off. And if we take a long-term view, and it's very hard to make that argument because it may not pay off. I mean, because it may take several decades to pay off, but we know that that is by far one of the best investments we can make. What I want to do is to move us to do more of that. I don't think that's the job of startups, but they certainly will benefit from us doing that. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I never want us to lose an opportunity to be self-critical and to improve. And that's why I asked you the question. What I heard back a little bit from you is that, well, there's actually a lot of good going on. And what's going on well in Silicon Valley, the cultural aspect, the accelerated learning, the iteration, the paying it for the mental models, the culture we build up here. You're like, hey, you know what? I go around the world and I like the rest of the world, but boy, I really like Silicon Valley. Like, I really like the way these people think. If we could have more of that elsewhere, that would make the world better, faster. And so maybe... Us thinking about how we articulate, how we encapsulate, how we promote what we do have here so that we don't use it, lose it, and that that helps to spread it around the world. Yeah. I mean, you're much closer to the kind of front lines of this culture and probably therefore have maybe more specific suggestions. I'm a groupie hanging out with these folks and scientists. I look at things in a kind of a global point of view. And as what I would say, as flawed as Silicon Valley might be, it is better than many of the other places trying to do what it is done. And again, I don't have prescriptions on how they do it. My one suggestion to them is I don't think that you can copy. You want to be the only. So everyone wants to be Silicon Valley in software. Like, no, no, that's already taken. Believe me. Be the Silicon Valley of something else, fashion or of 
Hollywood, they're doing it there. They have a different working system, a whole culture with these kind of ad hoc companies that come up and do things. It's sort of entrepreneur in that way. And so that's really great because they're only there. So we need a whole bunch of other onlys. They're doing other things. Maybe it's genetic engineering. Maybe it's going to be AI. I don't know. But there's lots of opportunities to be the only in having a culture with network effects, and again, Silicon Valley and even Shenzhen area, work with network effects. The more startups there are, the more that want to come, the more they want to come, the more the attractive it becomes. And so you want to have that kind of only network effects in a physical geographical place around the world, but they're not just all trying to do software. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great point. Everybody's got to find their own niche in the overall technium. <laughs> we all have a role to play, an old specialized niche role. Right. And every single organism alive today, every species alive today is hacking the rule. This is the only thing I learned by doing all species, which was this uh, program to catalog all the living species on the planet. And I hang around with taxonomists and they all have their creatures that they know about. And when you talk to them, you find out that every single is trying to hack the laws of biology. They have some workaround, some weird little thing that they're doing. You know, the males are inside the females or the, you know, whatever, just weird sexual practices, weird reproductive processes, all trying to hack the basic assumptions of biology. And that's sort of also what every startup is going to be doing one way or other is you're kind of trying to find a hack around the usual way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Hey, what are the three books you wish every startup founder would read? Finite and Infinite Games by James Carse. It's kind of a hard book to read. You don't need to read much of it. Read the first chapter and the last chapter. It divides the world into two kinds of games, games that are finite, which mean have winners or losers and uh, the rules are known and you play to win. And then there's infinite games where the rules are ambiguous and the whole point of the game is to keep playing the game. It's much more fun and better for everybody and much more rewarding and et cetera. And this is his case for infinite games, which is also sometimes called the non-zero sum game. So it's an infinite game. And what you want to be doing as a startup is looking for the infinite game because the network effects take place in infinite games. They can expand. Getting stuck on zero-sum games where there's winners and losers is the loser's game. <laughs> so Finite and Infinite Games, I read um, Hiring Smart, and I haven't, which was a really good book about how to hire. I remember it. It was recommended at Harvard Business School 20 years ago. Yeah, but the idea of learning how to hire, I do remember one of the things that Jeff Bezos was saying very early on about hiring. He says, one of the chief qualities I look for when I'm hiring people is their ability to hire <laughs> because that's all we're doing is we're growing so fast that we want to hire smart. And that is sort of my constraining factor. So learning how to hire smart, I think is really good. And there were some good suggestions there. That's a very practical thing. And, and number three, Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learn, which says that every building is a prediction. And all predictions are wrong. So when you're building something, you're making a prediction of how it's going to be used and you're likely to be wrong over the long term. It's going to be changing all the time. And, you know, that's sort of a little bit kind of like the ideas of pivoting. So the idea is that, you know, every company in a certain sense is a prediction and most predictions will be wrong. And he was suggesting things about different ways to accommodate or counter that while you were building something that was fixed and substantial. And so I think there could be good analogs about trying to build a company as if it was a building and how you want to counter the fact that you are going to have to keep changing it, that you're going to have to keep modifying as you go along. It's not a perfect 100% mapping, but it might be useful. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one I wish everyone would read, which is uh, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, which is a book that includes you in it and tells the story of Silicon Valley and the culture that you've been talking about and where it came from and why it is so unique and why it's so good. And uh, it's a great history written by a Stanford professor it's called From Counterculture, Fred Turner. Right. Fred Turner. And he was talking about the kind of role of Stuart in the whole catalog and Wired. And it's such a testimony to what this place can be if uh, people stay focused. So last question for you, Kim, what's the next 10 years for you? What's, what's that hold for you? I am one of those people who don't make plans, particularly at that scale. I have no idea what I'll be doing in 10 years, let alone even two years. Mm -hmm. But um, I know mm -hmm. one thing that I began this year, I made a commitment. And that was for 50 years, I've been a still photographer. I've had a still camera in my head. I've been text-based, book-based. I've been a 
person of the book. And I have made a very conscious, deliberate effort to become a person of the screen, to try to have a video camera in my head and to do everything video first. So I may write another textbook, but it was something that would be derived from something I do in video. So I am doing everything in video first, and then I can go out to the other media from that. And that's because I have become convinced that the center of culture is no longer books. My kids, their friends don't read books of any sort. They don't read my books. And that the center of the culture is in the moving images and on all size screens. And they spend their time, as I do these days, watching YouTube. And I want to be at the center of the culture learning how to do that video has been a huge hurdle for me because I have a still camera and now I've got to move it. It's a lot more effort. There's so many things to learn to master, not just no longer, you know, Photoshop. I've got to get Premiere or I've got to get Adobe 3D files. It's just a huge step, but that's what I'm committing to. So I would say, you know, in the next decade, I hope to be immersed in video and maybe whatever comes after video with the smart glasses, you know, AR, and that kind of stuff. That's where I want to be. That's what I'm deliberately trying to stake out. That's where I think the future of culture, particularly around here, is going to swim in. That is the new environment. And I haven't been that at ease with it in terms of being able to create it. And I'm trying to master it. Fantastic. It's a good way to end up. I think you're absolutely right. Good for you. Kevin Kelly, thank you so much. My pleasure, James. Thank you for having me. It was such a delight to talk to you as always. I wish we were walking as we did this, but we are sitting waving our arms instead. You've been listening to the NFX podcast. You can rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts, and you can subscribe to the NFX podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. For more information on building iconic technology companies, visit nfx.com. <laughs>